folks. I hope everyone's doing well today. My name is Carol Berzecki and I'm the Credentialing and Education Coordinator. I want to welcome everyone to this week's webinar with Dr. Robert James Stanley II. Um, he is our speaker today and he's also a diplomate of the American Board of Oral Implantology and here he is. Hello colleagues, welcome. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take control of the meeting here and I'm going to share my screen and start a presentation. What we're going to be talking about today is uh, an implant in the aesthetic zone and an immediate extraction and immediate placement. And um, let's go here and hit play. Okay, can you guys see that okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So let me move this. Uh, oh, yeah. Interesting. Okay, so here we go. Implants in the, in the uh, uh, fresh extraction socket. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with a video, and then after the video, we'll step through some, some slides that kind of explain why we did what we did. So first, we're gonna start off with how we do it, and then we're gonna talk about why we do it. So here we go. Uh, tooth number nine needs to come out. We're gonna place an immediate implant and do gap grafting. So as you can see, nine's broken off at the gum line. It's previously root canaled. Uh, so is eight. The first thing we do after we get them numb is we're going to elevate the tissues gently with a, a malt nine. And then we're going to use this product called the Cube, which is a piezotome from Acteon, which works really well. And we're going to go down on the mesial and in a rocking motion and on the distal and on the palatal, but never on the buccal, as the buccal bone is always really thin. And we're gonna come in for the purposes of the video, I use these straight forceps so you guys can see a little bit better. But once we get a hold of the neck, it's just a couple quick twists and the, the broken root tip comes right out. We're gonna go ahead and decorticate the socket and clean it out with a curette. And this is very important. We're gonna measure the buccal bone. And in this case, it's three millimeters below the free gingival margin. So it's in an ideal position for us. The buccal bone is intact. We're gonna use a fully guided type four guide. And in this particular case, what happens is we're only increasing the diameter of these drills as we step through the protocol. This is a green implant, so the guide sleeves are green. So we're stepping through, we're making the hole wider, and now we're going to place the implant. And as we're driving the implant, we've turned it on to two X speed, so we don't waste your time here. But as soon as that snap link touches the implant, we're down. Now that we're down, we want to make sure our timing is right, and this will make more sense in just a minute, but we're going to put our wrench on there. We're going to look at the, at the driver and make sure the driver has a flat spot to the buckle, and it does. We remove the guide and we place the healing cap into the implant very, very lightly. We don't want to, we don't want to wiggle this implant loose at this point because it doesn't have a lot of stability. And we're going to do is gap graph. We're going to graph the gap around the implant to help ensure that that tissue doesn't collapse during healing. Once the graft is in place, we retrieve the healing cap. And in this particular case, in the anterior, we've made a custom healing abutment. It's a titanium custom healing abutment that we designed uh, with Vulcan Dental Laboratories. And we just lightly screw that in place. And what that's going to do is that's going to help support that gingival margin and the papilla during the healing phase. So this is what it looks like from the occlusal. We have a very nicely placed implant. There's a little gap between the soft tissue and the, and, the, and the healing abutment, but note that it matches up nicely with the contralateral central. There's our radiograph. And to provisionalize this patient, we've given her an Essex to wear during the healing process. So that whole process, minus the actual getting the patient numb, usually takes about anywhere from four to 10 minutes to do. And we get pretty good results with that. So what I wanna do now is I wanna step through individual slides to kind of help you guys understand why we chose the, the path that we chose and give you some rationale for things. So when you look at a case like this and, the, and you have this tooth broken off in the anterior and it's in the aesthetic zone, one of the things you really wanna do is we wanna make sure when we're placing an implant in this area that we don't blunt the papilla. Uh, we don't blunt the papilla with our provisional, and we don't let the papilla flatten out by using a stock healing abutment that doesn't help form that papilla. Because if you've ever had it 
if you've ever had the papilla run away from you and it becomes flat, it's really, really hard to get that back later. And ultimately, unless you have a low smile line, you can really result in a, in a case that's not aesthetically pleasing. So here, here's our starting point. We're like, okay, it's broken off of the gum line. We do a, a prosthodontic driven protocol. So we're going to take two things. We're going to take a 3D scan and an optical scan. It doesn't matter what product you use. You just need those two things, a 3D scan and an optical scan. And we're going to merge them together in a software package. In our case, we use the three shape product and we merge them together and we plan the case. From the case, we get a guide that will help to ensure that we put the implant in the right location. So looking at it here, you need to understand how to predict primary stability into a fresh extraction socket. So when you look at a case like this, we've wondered for a number of years, how do you predict so that you can manage your patient appropriately and manage the case appropriately? And so what we came up with was something called the five thread guideline. And that was recently published in the, eight, um, the uh, Journal of Oral Implantology in the January, February edition, which no one read because everybody <laughs> got wrapped up with COVID. <laughs> but if you're so inclined when this is over and you're interested in getting a copy of it, send me an, uh, an email and uh, the contact information will be on the last slide of the, sh of the show today and I will send you a copy of the, of the paper. But basically it's called the five thread guideline. So when doing a digital workup like this, when I place the implant into this uh, radiograph, I want to ensure that I have five threads in the apical portion that are engaging bone. Now, all five threads don't have to be engaging bone. So you don't have to have five threads apical to the apex apices of the tooth you might have just two or three threads apical to the bottom of the tooth. And then you might have two or three threads on the mesial and two or three threads on the distal that are also engaging. If those threads add up to five threads or more, then the likelihood of primary stability when removing the, the root remnant is good. It's very, very good. So um, that's what we're looking at here. So in this case, I had uh, the five thread rule was intact. So we went ahead and got the, the guide made and now it's time to do the case. We're using a malt nine here. So if you were trained by oral surgery, you probably use a malt nine. If you were trained by a periodontist, you would use a 15 blade. Uh, this video is a little bit older. I'm using a 15 blade now to do this uh, light elevation. We're not really elevating the tissue and we're not popping papilla. We're just getting right around the neck of the tooth and getting those circumferential fibers uh, dislodged. So a 15 blade is even more uh, gentle to the tissue. And in these aesthetic cases, that's one thing you might wanna consider. And nevertheless, the, the Malt 9 works pretty well. So we go ahead and elevate the tissue. And then this cube product that I mentioned by Action. So I've been using piezos for a, for a number of years. This, this is not my first piezo that I've had. And just like anyone else out there who has used a piezo, you all understand that the main problem with piezos historically is that they don't have enough power. They just take too long, they're too slow, and they're not, they're not effective enough. But when it comes for, to aesthetic zone extractions, I have found no better tool than this cube by Action. It's a, the Action product has got more power than I need. I typically set the power setting to 75% of its max because the max power is really too much. And as you saw in the video, it really, really facilitates an easy extraction. We are gonna go down on the mesial and we're gonna do a rocking action with this little sword looking instrument, this piezo tone that we have. And we're just gonna sink it down to about the length of the, of the root remnant. And then we're gonna do the same thing on the mesial and we're gonna do it on the palate. But once again, never on the facial. And why is that? Well, that's because the literature shows clearly that the bone on the facial is typically one millimeter or thinner. So we don't have a lot of bone on the facial to work with. And if we lose that bone, we might have an aesthetic concern down the road with the dehiscence. So we're gonna stay away from the facial and you don't need to worry about it. So that's what we use the piezo for. So here we are on the palatal and then we get on it. Now, typically I use an ash forcep which is uh, sometimes called the parrot or the bird beak forcep. 
And the reason I do that is because that particular handheld instrument provides me a mechanical leverage advantage, a significant mechanical advantage leverage. So what I'm using here is not that instrument. This is a straight uh, forceps, straight forceps. And the reason I'm doing this is so that my hand doesn't block the camera so you guys can see what we're doing. But the action is the same. We're gonna get down right around the neck of the, of the root remnant and we're going to rotate. And as you saw in the video, it only took two rotations, one to the distal, one to the mesial, and the root remnant came right out. And that's typically what happens with this protocol. And here's the tooth coming out. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna clean out the site. And I use a, a, a curette that has been recently launched by Hugh Freedy. And this curette has serrations on it. And if you don't have one of these, you've gotta get one of these. They're inexpensive and they're wonderful. If you've ever used a curette, what happens? Sometimes you get one of those granulomas and you're picking at it forever, trying to get it out of the socket. This, with the little, with the little uh, teeth on this serrated curette, it allows you to grab onto these slippery little boogers and get them out of the uh, extraction site. It also helps to score the periost or score the lamina dura. One important thing to know is that if you do not get your socket to bleed proficiently, you're skipping the first step of healing, which is bleeding. We need that socket to bleed. And if you get the tooth out, if you get the root remnant out without any trauma to the socket, a lot of times it doesn't bleed well. So you've got to scrape it up. If you're not going to scrape it with a curette, then use an eight round uh, carbide in a slow speed to kind of roughen up that bone. Stay away from the facial. It's too thin. So we've cleaned it out. We've irrigated really well. We've gotten all the, all, any granulation tissue out. And now we're going to measure that buccal bone, that buccal plate. When we measure this particular case, the bone margin, the crestal margin there was within three millimeters of the free gingival margin as illustrated in this image right here. When I'm within three millimeters of that margin, I do not need to use a barrier membrane. The bone itself will act as a barrier membrane. I'm going to gap graft. That's what I call it, gap grafting. Because when we put the implant in, the cross section of the implant is a circle and the hole we took it out of is a triangle, right? If you do a cross section of an anterior central, the, the, the cross section looks kind of like a triangle. So that means there's gonna be gaps and we wanna get graft material into those gaps. We're not doing it because we wanna protect it from uh, uh, soft tissue ingrowth. We're doing it because we don't want that tissue to collapse and have an unesthetic outcome. So in this particular case, when the bone is within three millimeters, we don't need a barrier membrane. What if the bone wasn't within three millimeters? What if, the, what if there was no bone, uh, the, pa the patient had an apical infection and the facial bone had just kind of melted away? Well, in that case, we would have needed to have a barrier membrane. So we would have used, in our case, we would have used a cross-linked collagen membrane to go down on the facial aspect. This is called Tarnow's ice cream cone technique. And you can, uh, you can access that paper on PubMed. And if you haven't seen it, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely paper. And go ahead and cut the uh, uh, cross-linked collagen into the shape of an ice cream cone and slide it down on the facial. And that prevents the intact blood supply of the, peri um, the periosteum on the underside of the soft tissue from growing into your graft. Since we don't have that situation, we have bone that's preventing the soft tissue from growing into our graft, we don't need to worry about it. So that's why there was no barrier membrane used in this case. When we graft a case like this, we like to use Mineros by BioHorizons. It is a cortical concellus allograft. And why we use that is because it turns over slowly, but not uh, not too fast and not too slow, but it does turn over and eventually it turns into your own bone. And that's what I want to have around the implant. I want bone around the implant. I don't like using a xenograft in a case like this because the xenograft hangs around a very, very long time. Now we get bone to grow around the xenograft, but now we have a composite bone and it's possible that this composite bone composed of two different materials, one natural bone and the other one is the xenograft isn't as strong. So we do use xenograft for like veneer grafts and areas where we want aesthetic uh, volume. 
but we don't use it in the socket because we don't want it to stay around a long time. We want natural bone in that area. So we've measured it. We're within three millimeters. We can go ahead and, and be uh, uh, okay with doing the graft around our implant without a barrier membrane. So the guide goes in. Uh, the guide is designed to have a stop position. So the drill just goes down on this green handle that you see here called a guide sleeve. And you just go all the way down until it can't go in any further. Every one of the drills is the same length. What's happening is if you can see on the green handle there, it says 2.0. This is the guide sleeve for the 2.0 drill, which is our starter drill. So we're gonna step through the drill protocol. We're gonna do 2.0. Then we're gonna do the, the two five, then we're gonna do the three two, which you see here. And in this particular case, we're placing a 4.2 millimeter uh, BioHorizons implant in the anterior. So we're gonna stop at the three two. So we're stopping a, a whole millimeter below the, the, the final size because we really wanna make sure that we get a little bite in that apical aspect. So now that the hole is drilled, we can then pick up our implant on our driver our driver is the, the part that you see that has the uh, yellow and green on it. And at the, at the bottom of the screen, right above the, the uh, motor itself, you'll see a snap link. And that snap link can go into one of four positions. In this particular case, it's in what we call stop position four. It doesn't really matter. Each case will have a different stop position and it's determined mathematically by the laboratory. So when the case comes in, you get a little case report, you open up the case report and it says, for this case, doctor put the, put the snap link on the stop position four. So what does that mean? It means when I carry this to the mouth, I'm going to drive this implant until that snap link touches the top of the surgical guide. Once it touches the top of the surgical guide, I now, now, I now know that my implant is to the proper depth, okay? Excuse me. Once we've accomplished proper depth, we want to make sure that we have our timing right. For those of you that don't understand what the word timing refers to, inside the implant is a hex. Uh, a hex means there's six sides to the hex. We want to have one of those flat hex sides facing out towards the facial. So as you can see, the way this uh, wrench is on this right now, it's already pretty much aligned. So we got really lucky in this case. When I stopped the motor, it stopped with the flat, pretty much the facial, so I didn't have to adjust it much. If it was off a little bit, I would use this hand wrench to turn the driver until the flat was lined up with the facial. The reason that's important is that later on when we get to the prosthodontic portion of it, if we want to use some parts that are designed to have off angled access, the hex has to line up with those. So all you have to do is make sure that the flats to the facial and it gives you more freedom later on with your prosthodontic solutions. Okay, so in this case, it was lined up and we were good to go. And we're gonna to carry to the mouth. What comes in the BioHorizons implant is a, a complementary healing cap. It's not a healing abutment, it's a healing cap. So it has no height to it. And in this case, we're gonna use this as a temporary blocking device to keep the bone particles from going inside my implant, okay? So we carry it to the mouth and very, very carefully, we rotate this very carefully, why? Because remember, we have about five threads engaging bone, which is not a lot. It's enough to allow the implant to integrate, but it's not a lot. So if we were to put some off axis loads on this healing cap, we could inadvertently loosen up the implant and then we would have a failure. So this goes in very, very lightly. And then after it does, we do a four-handed technique to bring the bone particles to the mouth. So the spoon you see on the lower right coming in is being held by my assistant. The, the hand you see on the left side of the screen, that's my hand. I'm using a product called a curved pocket packer. It's sold by Salvin and it's also sold by Hugh Freedy. And if you don't have one of these and you're doing these cases, you gotta get one. It's like a condenser, like, a, like you would use a, an amalgam condenser except it's curved and it's skinny like a spatula. What that allows you to do is to slide down between the gap and the implant because it's curved, the curved side goes up against the implant and allows you to get your bone particles down deep inside the gap. So you gotta have one of these if you're doing one of these cases. 
So the assistant brings in the bone graft on the spoon and holds it level so it doesn't fall to the back of the mouth. And then I scoop off the top with my instrument and into the hole. So it works really, really well. I'll show you the video again here at the end and you'll be able to see it real quickly uh, as we do it. But we slide it off and then what I do is I tap it down really lightly, wiggling uh, the bone particles to get them to fit in place, but not compressing them too firmly. I, don't want, I want space for blood to flow around them to create a nice blood clot. I don't want it to be too tight. I just want it to be full. At that point, we can retrieve our healing cap. We no longer need it. It's already done its job, which is to prevent the bone particles from going into the hole. And then it's time to place this. This is a healing abutment that we designed off of the digital plan before we did the surgery. And in this particular case, this one's made out of titanium and it's done in the factory, it's done in the laboratory for me, which is just great. Cause I, I could do this with something called the eye shell, which is a thin uh, walled plastic uh, membrane that you can sit down around uh, the implant after it's placed. And then you can float some a uh, looting agent around a stock, healing, a stock abutment and create one of these yourself. And that's a wonderful thing to do, except it takes chair side time. And I'm not particularly interested in doing that. I'd rather spend a couple of dollars and have the lab prefabricate one of these for me. You can also, I oftentimes have these anodized. This one was not anodized, but I oftentimes have them anodized to pink. Uh, that way, if part of the metal is showing, it's less uh, obtrusive for the patient. So we're gonna come in and we're gonna place this in place. Normally, I request that this unit is designed with um, a non-indexing abutment. And what that means is that if you looked on the underside, instead of having a hex on the abutment that matches the hex on the inside of the implant, it would have a, sil a, a circle, a cylinder. And that cylinder would allow me to uh, rotate the button to any position on top of the, the implant. And that gives me a little bit of freedom. The issue is, is that when we use these metal ones, they don't come, they don't come with the non-index hex. You have to get them with the hex. Uh, if you did it with PMMA, if you made your uh, provisional, uh, uh, your custom healing abutment out of a PMMA milled solution, then you can get it with a non-index. So that's a little tip for you to, to know. But we're gonna put this in and this is gonna do a couple of things. Number one, it's gonna hold those papilla. As I mentioned before, if you lose the papilla, it's really a, a, a prosthodontic nightmare, a periodontic nightmare trying to grow them back. It's really, really hard to do. You can probably hear it in my voice. Obviously it's happened to me in the past because I'm trying to really prevent that from happening. So if we put this in and we hold that papilla, on the mesial and the distal and the facial, uh, the facial keratinized tissue, and we hold it during the healing process, it's a whole lot easier later on to get a good solution. So that's what we're doing. The second thing is, is it might be obvious to you, is that it's creating a roof right over our bone graft. It's basically holding our bone graft intact in the hole. Another reason why we don't need a barrier membrane to hold it. No sutures needed, we didn't pop any papilla, we have no loose tissue, so there's no sutures needed. That saves on suture money, it saves on time, it makes the process go quicker for the patient and they like that. There's also not a suture retrieval appointment necessary. So this goes in, lightly uh, tighten it to finger tightness. Here it is from the facial, um, I'm sorry, from the occlusal, and you can see it's very close to the adjacent teeth. It's within a millimeter to two millimeters of the adjacent teeth to really, really push that soft tissue. You can have control over this design. All you do is you, you just ask the lab to send you the PDF with the plan. And if you don't like the plan, if the plan doesn't look right to you, you can write back and say, here's the simple change I'd like for you to do. Or you can say, can we do a, a, a team view or a go-to meeting? And they'll, they'll be happy to get on the team view and pull it up and you can say, okay, right here on the distal, can you make that a little bit more scalloped so that it touches the adjacent tooth a little bit better and we get a better fill. So I love these, I use these a lot in the anterior. Why didn't we just go with a custom healing abutment and a provisional crown and take that crown out of occlusion? Well, the answer is we, we, we very well could have, but we're always trying to reduce risk. And as you're talking to a patient, 
sometimes you can get a sense for whether they're going to be compliant with the post-operative instructions. And if you have someone, you're a little concerned that they don't understand the concept of not chewing on an implant, then doing this solution is maybe better indicated for them. If, if I had a patient that I absolutely, a rule follower, you know those types, right? The rule follower is in the chair. You're like, okay, I need you not to chew on this. And they're like, yes, sir, Dr. Stanley, not a problem, Dr. Stanley. I won't, I won't chew on it, Dr. Stanley. I promise, Dr. Stanley. Then those people, they'd be a great, a great candidate for going straight to a custom healing abutment to support that tissue and a provisionalization so that it's all in one solution and then make sure that the provisional is out of occlusion. In this case, I didn't have that sense. So I went with a custom healing abutment and then we did an Essex to, to give the patient um, a temporary during the healing process. I mentioned in the video, I left a little gap there. Now you can see, if you look at the free gingival margin of tooth number eight, and you compare it to the free gingival margin of the, of the custom healing abutment, they're the same. That's why I left that gap there, because I really want that soft tissue to grow down and fill into that space, because ultimately that's where the margin on the tooth needs to be. So that's why we left the gap. But look at how well it's adapted on the mesial and the distal. It's very well adapted. Here's our radiograph at the time of placement, and it looks great. We've, we've maintained all of the crustal bone interproximally, so we believe we're gonna have a really good outcome here. And the Essex goes in, we adjust the Essex, make sure that it's not putting any pressure on our implant during the healing process, and the patient goes home with a lovely solution. So let's go ahead and run the video one more time. So here we go. Extraction of tooth number nine, immediate implant placement and gap grafting. So we have the broken tooth. Radiographically, we plan it. We ensure that the five thread rule tells us that we have a high probability that we can take the root tip out and get the implant in in one procedure. We use the Acteon cube piezotome to help remove the tooth without any trauma to the surrounding tissues. We use it on the mesial. We use it on the face, on the lingual, and we use it on the distal, but we never use it on the facial. All right. We're going to come in with the straight forceps for the purposes of the video, but we would use ash forceps if no one was looking. And we do the same thing. We rotate and the tooth comes right out. We clean out the socket, get out any infection, irrigate really well, and make sure that we have it bleeding. We assess the crustal bone, make sure that it's within three millimeters of the free gingival margin. If so, we don't need a barrier membrane. We place our prefabricated type four fully guided guide. We step through the drill sequence, which is just changing in diameter. The length is the same for all of them. We step through this protocol, stopping with a three, two, and then we're gonna drive our implant until the snap link touches the, the guide and that ensures that our implant is down to the proper depth. We're gonna adjust and refine the timing. In this case, we really didn't need to, we, we got lucky, we, we nailed it right on the head. The guide comes out, the healing cap goes in temporarily as a blocking device to keep bone particles from going inside our implant. And there's our perfectly positioned uh, implant. I like to do screw retained. So I've designed this case to come out through the cingulum of the central. We're using our curved pocket packer and our mineral os cortical concellus bone chips from BioRisons to pack the bone in. Once we've got it packed sufficiently, we remove the healing cap and we place our custom titanium healing abutment in place. Finger tighten, we don't need to put a wrench on this. And we're gonna let that tissue right there fill in with time. Over the next couple of days, it'll fill in nicely. Hardly bleeding, this is a lovely solution for the patient. And before they walk out the door, we create an Essex and we deliver that as a temporary. We give the patient oral hygiene instructions and we're done. Okay, so at this point, what I'd like to do is say, if you have any uh, interest in seeing the five thread rule guideline, I'm sorry, five thread guideline, 
uh, and getting a copy of that paper that describes how to predict primary stability into fresh extraction sites, just shoot me an email at drrobert at stanleyinstitute.com and I'd be happy to, to send you a copy of that. Uh, let's field some questions. I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. Um, not on Facebook or here, but please feel free to chime in if you have any. You know, if no one asks me any questions, I will be uh, compelled to tell my wife tonight that I gave a presentation and I did such a good job that there were no questions. <laughs> <Funny>. <laughs> So surely there are people out there that would say, okay, so why didn't you extract the tooth, graft the site, let it heal, and then come back and place an implant? Because traditionally, you know, maybe 10 years ago, that would have been a very uh, common procedure to do. And I, th I think the, the answer is, is that you don't get in the, especially in the aesthetic zone, I think in the non-aesthetic zone, that's a still a very valid uh, course of action. But in the aesthetic zone, if you do that protocol, it's very, very hard to maintain the papilla. You would have to design your Essex with an ovate ponic that goes two millimeters into, two millimeters in the center of the ovate ponic uh, into your extraction site to help support that tissue during healing. And that's not easy to do. It's not easy to fabricate chair side and get it perfect. So uh, that's really hard to do. And if you lose that papilla, it's really hard to come back and, and grow that papilla later. So in the anterior zone, we, we almost always do this immediate replacement. In our, in our institute, what we call this is we call it the God rule. And the, the God rule is really simple. Um, if we can replace what God created, i.e. a tooth, with something as similar to what God created, in our case, it would be an implant and a bone graft, if we can replace it with as close as possible to what he had created or he or she had created, then we can likely have the best outcome. And so that's what we found through Tarnow's, Tarnow's work out of New York is that if we can get an implant in and we can get a graft in and then we can put a, some sort of provisional abutment and or provisional uh, solution on top of the implant to support the soft tissues and protect the bone graft, we get really, really good answers. So there was a question that came in. So what is the protocol for the barrier membranes? So the barrier membrane protocol is this. Anytime you have an intact blood supply that, is, that, that, that intact blood supply is coming from soft tissue, you need to block it. You need to block it. So if you were going into a site, let's say you were going in the posterior uh, mandible and you were doing a ridge augmentation and in this particular procedure, what you were gonna do is you're gonna make a mid-crestal incision, you were gonna open up the tissue, you were gonna graft the site, and then you were gonna close that tissue right back up over where it was and suture right along the seam. What you would have is you would have an intact periosteum blood supply sitting on top of your bone graft, all right? In that case, you'd want a barrier membrane. The two main choices that you can do is you can do a collagen membrane, or you can do something like a dense PTFE, a plastic that does not resorb. The benefit of the collagen membrane is that it resorbs. It goes away with time. The, the, the benefit of the, uh, the Gore-Tex membrane or the PTFE membrane is it doesn't go away, but you do have to retrieve it. So that's what you would use. In a extraction site, and this is really, really important to understand. In an extraction site, if you just took out a tooth and did nothing, what would grow in the hole? That's right, bone. Bone grows in the hole. No one has ever taken out a tooth and then the patient comes back uh, a month later and you look and then there's a big invagination, looks like the Grand Canyon and there's nothing but soft tissue in that hole. It doesn't happen. The body's not programmed to do that. So what Donna Starnow found out is that if you put an implant in that hole, 
the hole still fills in with bone and the bone grows right up to the implant. So we don't need a barrier membrane unless we have an intact blood supply. In an extraction socket, the top does not have a blood supply unless you extend, unless you make a flap and then extend the tissue over the top of the extraction socket. Now we don't wanna do that. And the main reason we don't wanna do that is because where would your free gingival margin end up when you were done with that? Your free gingival margin, if you, if you, if you release the buccal tissue, and then you stretch it over your extraction socket to the palatal side and then sutured it in place, your free gingival margin would be on top of the ridge, nowhere near where it should be, which is on the, on the facial or buccal aspect of your villus. So that is not a good idea. So we don't do that, do we? And we don't have invagination with an, with an extraction socket and we don't have invagination, excuse me, when we do a bone graft in a socket either. So we don't use collagen membranes for that. When would we use a collagen membrane? When we take the, when we take the root remnant out and there's a dehiscence, there's no bone. Let's say there's no bone on the facial at all, okay? What is covering the facial? Periosteum. Before you did the extraction, the periosteum, the, the, the attached gingival keratinized tissue is covering the root, okay? So on the underside, what do you have? You have periosteum sitting on top of tooth. When you take the tooth out, the periosteum is exposed to the extraction socket, which means that if you put a bone graft in there, you have periosteum up against bone graft without a barrier membrane, that could potentially be a problem. And in that case, you put a barrier membrane in. And then what we like to use, we like to use a Memlock by BioHorizons. It's a cross-link collagen membrane. What's the cross-link do? It does a couple of things. One, it hangs around a little longer. And two, it makes it a little bit easier for me to work with. When we've, when we've tested out non-cross-linked collagen membranes, it's like working with wet toilet paper. So you take a piece of toilet paper and make it wet and now try to work with it. It's really kind of hard to work with. So we don't, we don't like that so much. We like the, the cross-linked collagen and we use Mem, uh, Memlock for that. So that's, that's a question about the Memlock. We, I see we have another question. It's a question about laser lock and is it more useful to be on the abutment rather than the implant itself? So, uh, there's a question about laser lock and laser lock is a patented laser technique, a laser technique, which a uh, BioHorizons has the rights on. And what they do is around the top of their implant and around the bottom of some imp uh, abutments, they create these little grooves. And what these grooves have been proven to do and then proven to do uh, is facilitate the growth of two things, bone or connective tissue, so both. So it's quite remarkable that it does this, but what it ends up doing is it creates a nice tight seal with the connective tissue around the neck of your implant. If you stop and you think about it for a second, there's only one spot on the entire body where anything penetrates our epithelium, and that's teeth. It's the only spot in the body. Everything else is covered and intact. Hair doesn't do it and nails don't do it. They're a continuation of epithelium. They're intact with the epithelium, but the teeth are not. In fact, that particular interface where the tooth comes through the gingiva is so important that in dentistry, we have an entire discipline called periodontics designed to work on that one little interface. And that's how important it is. And we know it's that, we know how important it is, right? Periodontal disease and, and, and all the things that go around are super, super important. So when we go into implantology, what are we doing? We're removing a tooth that's coming through the tissue and we're putting a titanium post. So doesn't it make sense that if I have a titanium post coming through the skin in the only place on the body, that it would be a really good idea to get a nice tight seal around that implant? Because if I don't, it would be a very easy place for bacteria and debris to go down into that little gap and cause problems. So laser lock helps to facilitate that. It creates a very, very tight seal around the neck and it comes on the implant and it comes on the abutment. Now, why is that important? Well, there's a little pet peeve of mine and that is called the level of the bone, okay? So sometimes because I've been doing this a while, back in the old days, people would say, where do you place the implant? How deep do you place the implant? And the old timer would say, I place the implant at the level of the bone. And I used to scratch my head and think, where's the level of the bone? In the case you just saw, in the radiograph that we just showed, let me, let me go back here. Can I go back? Let's see here. 
I'm going to show you this picture. And tell me where the level of the bone is in that radiograph. On the mesial, the bone is high. On the distal, the bone is high. On the buccal, the bone is low. The actual contours of this bone in this location mathematically is called something called the saddle point. It looks like a saddle on a horse. It goes up on two ends, it goes down across the middle, it looks just like a saddle, it's called a saddle point. There is no level of bone. So using this concept of placing implants at the level of the bone doesn't make a lot of sense to me, which plays into this thing called laser lock. I said that laser lock has a dual affinity. It works well with soft tissue and it works well with bone. Well, when we place this implant, do you see that it's possible that part of this implant is under the bone? and part of it might be in touch, touching or in contact with soft tissue. So it makes a lot of sense to have a solution around the neck of the implant that helps with both because there is no level of bone. If there was, it would be a little bit easier for us implantologists, but it's very, very rare. And there's not an opportunity to really go in and level this bone. In between these two teeth, you can't do it. It's possible that you could level the bone when you're doing full mouth, it's possible to level the bone when you're doing something in the posterior where you were missing three teeth and you want to level the bone. But that would be clinician's choice. It's not how it happens naturally. It's just not level. It's always curved. So laser lock works great because of that dual affinity and the fact that you never know when your implant is going to be touching bone or soft tissue. Okay, so uh, is, there's another question. Is there another temporary option besides the Essex? So yes, there is. One of the other solutions that we've used quite, quite often that works really well with certain cases is a snap-on smile. Snap-on smile for people, uh, and, and this is also beneficial for the patient and for you oftentimes as a clinician because once they put the snap-on smile on and they see how beautiful their teeth can look, a lot of times that can convert into more dental work for you. So they come back and they say, you know what, this snap-on smile has got me thinking, Maybe I should do some whitening or maybe I should do some veneers or some crowns or something to make the rest of my teeth look good. So that's a good thing. But in order to do a snap on smile, you have to have a couple things. You have to have a, basically some space. Uh, ideally, if you have someone who has a lot of diastemas or open gaps between their teeth, those people work great for, for snap on smiles. The rule of thumb for provisionalization, for temporization or rather, is that you don't want to put any pressure on the implant. So if we move from those two options, we move from the Essex and we move from the, the Snap-on Smile, if we move to a solution like a unilateral a partial, commonly known as a flipper, what's the problem with that? The problem is, is that it can, it can put pressure on the tissue surrounding the implant. So initially, when we're in that initial healing phase, we don't like that as a solution because it can, it can wiggle the implant and that could cause a problem for, for integration. So we try to stay away from that during the initial healing process because that can be pr problematic. But the Essex is a really good one. There's another option that we do a lot in a case like this where we're taking, well, not like this, but prior to the crown separating from the root, if the crown was intact, a lot of times we'll extract the, the tooth and the crown, separate the root structure, do retrograde root canal on the tooth if it hasn't been done, and turn the crown into a pontic and then go in, put the crown back in the mouth with a stent that we made, a putty stent that we made prior to starting. We put that back in the mouth so we can register it, and then we lute it with some flowable between the two natural teeth on either side. And that works really, really well. The only problem with that is you can't access the implant without popping it off. So it's kind of like you do that and you let that ride for three months, and then you pop it off when it's time to start the process uh, at the end after they're done healing. So that's also something that works really well. I'll tell you my favorite thing to do in the posterior, nothing. That's right. In the back, I don't like to put anything in the back. If I can convince the patient to go without in the back, it saves them a little bit of money. It reduces the risk of the overall process because there's no likelihood that they're going to inadvertently chew on that if there's nothing back there. So in the back, if they can't see it, it's in the non-aesthetic zone. I try not to put any temporary back there. So those are some good questions, guys. Thank you for answering those, Dr. Stanley. We just have two more or three more questions. There's a couple more questions on Facebook. The first one is, do you utilize socket shield when indicated? 
So the question is, do I utilize sh socket shield when indicated? Correct. Socket shield is a process, for those who don't, don't know what that is, socket shield is a process of leaving a, face, a, a portion of the tooth, the root remnant left on the facial aspect to help maintain that thin buccal bone that we talked about. So I have not participated in this procedure and I will explain to you why. One of our guidelines that we talk about when placing implants, because we do a prosthodontic driven protocol, we start with the end in mind, then we back into where the implant needs to go. And then we assess once we know where the implant needs to go with respect to the, to the final solution, how much bone do we have around our proposal? Our goal is to have two millimeters of bone on the facial of our implant, on the buckle of our implant. So in a case like this, if I plan the case properly, from the buckle bone to the implant is going to be two millimeters of, of, of space. Now I say space because when we take the root out, there may be a gap between that buckle bone and the implant. So let's say the buckle wall is one millimeter thick and now there's a one millimeter gap and then you get to the titanium on the implant, that's two millimeters. What do I do? I graft it. And what we found is that if you get two millimeters on the facial, a couple of things happen. Number one, the implant doesn't show. So it covers the grayness of the titanium. So you don't see, you don't have any implant showing through. And number two, it doesn't, it doesn't um, dehiss and you don't get any uh, defects. You don't have any defects on the facial where the soft tissue starts to run away. So if you follow this rule called the 3A2B rule, initially created by Dr. Lyndon Cooper uh, out of UNC, now out of Chicago, um, but it, his 3A2B rule that he came up with, if you get uh, 3A is place the implant three millimeters apical to the desired free gingival margin. So it's a prosthodontic rule. We're starting with the end of mine and then place the implant two millimeters to the palate or give yourself two millimeters of buccal space. If you do that, you get an aesthetic outcome and we haven't found the need for, for leaving part of the tooth structure left. And, it, and doing the socket shield uh, technique. Thank you. And the second question, I also posted it in the chat because it's a little bit longer. This is from Dr. Shirbani. Um, what if you feel you are not in the right place and need some modification, like you are too, excuse me if I mispronounce these words, like you are too buckly and want to change it to palatal direction, parentheses, for some reason, like not having very accurate guide, and parentheses, mm -hmm. if there, is there any approach to change the direction or alignment during the procedure? So, okay, so let me, that was a great question. I understand it perfectly. Okay. The question is, with this guided protocol, is there an opportunity to uh, change your, your plan if you wanted to? And the, the answer is yes, but it's, it's kind of, uh, it, it requires a little background. So if you just take the guide off, you can go right back to freehand. So if you felt like, if you felt compelled that you were off, you go back to freehand. But in all the years that I've been doing fully guided and I, I adopted fully guided, I was doing guided uh, early on before the companies even had fully guided. And when, when I use the word fully guided, what, it's very important that you understand this. It means that it's a static guide or a dynamic guide being a robot, but that it drills all of your holes, all of your holes are drilled, so all your osteotomy holes are drilled, and your implant is constrained during the placement. If you don't have that, you don't have a type four guide. So real quick, type zero guide is no guide. Type one guide is a visual aid. So it's like a suck down with a line on it, okay? A type two guide would be a guide that would allow you to drill a 2.0 pilot hole. So type two guide, a 2.0 pilot hole, but everything else is freehand. A type three guide is you drill your 2.0 and then you drill your subsequent osteotomy drill. So maybe your 2.5 and your 3.0, but then you still place the implant freehand. And then a type four guide, fully guided, you drill all the osteotomy holes, plus you place the implant through the guide. Now, why is that important? It's important because the implant diameter is wider than the hole that you make. The hole you make has to be smaller than the implant, otherwise the, the, the threads on the implant won't have anything to bite onto. 
they'll be in free space and you won't grab. So we're gonna place this implant into a hole that's smaller than the implant itself. What happens is if the, if the threads hit some hard bone anywhere in that hole on one side, they will not bite into that hard bone if there's soft bone on the other side. And the implant will kick out of position, it'll knock out of position and you'll get a less than ideal result. So you wanna make sure that if you're doing guided, if you haven't tried guided, you wanna go fully guided. You wanna have, you wanna have the guide constraining the implant during placement so it doesn't get knocked out of position. In all the years we've been using fully guided, we've never had a case, not a single case, where we've had an implant go through the guide that it didn't reflect what our plan was. So if it was planned to go in a spot, it went in that spot every single time. I have done studies that have shown routinely that the tolerance, excuse me, that the tolerance error in one of these fully guided systems is about 200 microns, okay? 200 microns clinically, clinically for an implant placement, I don't think there's anybody out there that would actually visually see 200 microns, it's too small. That's how accurate these fully guided are. So I've never had to go back to a fully guided, uh, to, a, to a freehand system as a, as a backup plan. And quite honestly, if, um, let's say I was placing an implant and the guy broke, I would just abort the procedure and do the case the next day. I would, I would print a new guide and I would just do the case the next day. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, well, I've got the, that my goal in life is to get this implant in today and sacrifice, potentially sacrifice the long-term stability of the implant by putting it in the wrong or slightly in the wrong position. So I would abort and redo it. So if the guide broke or the guide didn't fit, a lot of times the guides come in, if there's any distortion in the guide, it's very simple to just take a diamond around, like an eight round diamond and clean out the, uh, the, um, the intaglio surface of your guide a little bit in the interproximal spot. Because what we find is that sometimes the interproximal spot will hold the guide from seating properly. And then the guide will seat just fine. There's, there's windows on the guide that allow you to visualize the teeth sticking through the guide to make sure that the guide is down all the way. And that's the first step. You gotta make sure that it's down all the way. If it's down all the way, you're in good shape. All right, that looks like it was all of our questions today. Um, we'd like to thank you again, Dr. Stanley, for sharing your case with us. Um, if anyone would like to reach out and has more questions, you did provide your information. Um, we hope to see everyone next week for our case with Dr. William Liang. Um, stay safe and thank you again. Thanks guys, take care.